Welcome to today's video, where we will guide you through the folklore and fairy tales that inspired the game that motivated us to make this video, Bramble the Mountain King. In the game we see and meet several characters that might be familiar to you if you grew up in Scandinavia, from the Trolls and John Bowers illustrations, to Theodore Kittelsen's depiction of the Black Plague in the form of the sickness demon Pesta. The folklore of the Nordic countries is rich and deep, and we are here to guide you through some of it by taking a closer look at what we can find in the game. In the game, the gnomes are portrayed as tiny humanoids wearing red and pointed hats, a very classical and recognizable look. They are inhabitants of the forest where they live in harmony with nature, farming cloudberries and herding rump nissar. The majority of the ones we meet in the game are very childlike in nature, while the elders shown are more akin to a very old man that seems to be in a guardianship of the small ones and in charge of herding the rump nissar. They help Ulle along his travels, just like Ulle is also helping them along the way more or less successfully. In real life, or according to Swedish folklore, the gnome, or tomte as they are called in Swedish, looked quite similar to the elder gnomes in the game. They were often described as very human-like in appearance, like old men with long beards and hair, but small. Often wearing grey or blue old-timey clothes, fit for work at a farm and a hat sometimes described as red. The Tomte was a solitary entity, and always male. In folklore it is said that they took care of a farm or a house, or guarded the land of the house they resided in. He would keep the homestead safe as long as he got respect from the humans. The gnomes in the game are more similar to the entity or vasen known as Vitra. Vitra is very similar to Tomte in looks, but comes in both male and female forms. They lived lives underground in small societies or family groups and would wear clothes very similar to humans as well. Sometimes they lived close to humans under our houses or farms and sometimes they would live out in nature under rocks or old trees. They even kept their own farm animals like cows, sometimes described as having special attributes like being red. These were called Witterko or Witter cow. Vitra is one of the many names this entity has. In some parts of Sweden it is known as Vette or Disma under Jordi, which can be translated to the small ones under the ground. In the game the fairies are portrayed as small elf-like but feral creatures. One can be seen hissing at Ulla as he approaches the gnome's house they don't have any major role in the game, but they're an interesting addition nonetheless. The fairies of Swedish folklore and fairy tales are very much like those found in other parts of Europe, like in England. Often described as small, dressed in white and a beauty that would mesmerize anyone who would be lucky enough to see one. But if one were to see a fairy, it was important to not interact with them, as they would try to lure the unsuspecting victims with them to their realm. They were very shy creatures, but playful, and when mists were seen rolling over the landscapes, it was believed to be the fairies dancing over the meadows in a magical dance during the late summer evenings. Besides the gnomes, there's two other creatures about the same size, namely the kottefolk and the rumpnissar. The kottefolk look like pine cones with arms and legs, and the rumpnissar look like tiny people with jutron on their heads. The rumpnissar seems to bear some form of function for the gnomes, as they are herded as cattle into fenced areas. They bear a resemblance to the small folk of Swedish author and illustrator Elsa Beskov's tales and illustrations where these characters sometimes sport heads or hats resembling berries, mushrooms and flowers. The name Rumpnisse or Rumpnissar in plural 
originally came from the children's fantasy book Ronja the Robber's Daughter by Swedish author Astrid Lindgren. This book describes them as small human-like creatures, shy in nature and not very bright. This is shown in the 1984 movie adaption, where they are seen dressed in ragged clothes, moss and lichen. It is also shown how they live in dens underground in flocks with individuals of different ages. Olle and his sister briefly stumble upon the Frog King, a magical frog or toad-like creature that befriends Olle. Magical frogs or toads are known in folklore to sometimes be trolls, fairies or vitra in disguise, but in some cases they're an entirely separate entity. In northern Sweden there was a particular breed of magical toads known as meokan, which everyone was forbidden to harm as they would cause great trouble to anyone who would dare injure or disrespect them in any way. Whenever you saw a toad, you couldn't be sure if it was a normal toad or a magical one, so better to play it safe and treat it well. In the game, the trolls are depicted as monstrous humanoids hunting for prey to feed the mountain king. They resemble the trolls made by beloved Swedish artist John Bauer with their long and big noses long pointed ears and long tails. They seem to have different occupations. The tall and slender one roams the woods in search of sacrifice, while the more heavily built troll traps and slaughters moose and other animals, perhaps for the trolls to eat. The trolls in Nordic folklore and fairy tales vary a lot, and they are usually very different depending on who would illustrate the tales or where the folklore originates from. In Swedish folklore, they are usually described as very human-like, much like the Skogsro and other beings. They were so similar to humans that it was almost impossible to see any difference. But much like the Skogsro, there were signs to look for, as they had long tails that they would hide under their clothes. They even lived in societies much like our own, but deep inside the mountains or underground, where they kept animals and lived lives very much like the Vitra did. Sometimes the trolls would interact with humans. Lost items or food going missing would often be attributed to being stolen by trolls and other magical beings. Trolls would sometimes kidnap humans, exchanging their children with ours, leaving a changeling to be taken care of by the humans. A changeling could be returned by threatening to harm it or threat to christen it the latter being very effective as the trolls despised anything related to Christianity. In fairy tales, they were depicted in many different shapes and sizes, often with long noses, long hair, ears, tails and with fur. They were often portrayed as something that is part of nature, not separate from it, like humans. Obviously the ones of folklore also had much closer relationship with nature than we did. In fairy tales, they were also usually not very bright and could easily be tricked even by children. In the game, we get a glimpse of a potential shapeshifter when Ole falls down the troll's moose pit. The body of the moose looks normal at first, but blink and you'll miss the fact that the moose has human hands. In the concept art of the game, there is an illustration of what the moose looked like while it was still alive, before falling down to its gruesome and painful death. In folklore all over the world, we can read about shapeshifters. In Nordic folklore, it was very common for beings and entities like trolls, vitra and skogsro to have the ability to shapeshift into animals. Even some humans with magical abilities could shapeshift into wolves or bears at will known as werewolves or werebears. In the Icelandic sagas of Norse mythology, there is also a mention of the Elgfrodi, or Elifrode in Swedish. They were some kind of being that lived in the forest, described as being half human and half moose. Sometimes they were described with two legs and sometimes four-legged. But not much is known about them.
Lemus is an original creature by Dim Frost. Although not directly lifted from Nordic folklore and legends, it was inspired by a John Bauer painting. Lemus is a giant that might at first glance look like a big boulder, but with big eyes and a wide smile, he really stands out from a normal rock. Olle finds Lemus being attacked by the Kottefolk and saves him from them. After this, they become best friends. He doesn't have any legs and is seen standing up on his hands instead. He travels most likely by magical means, by transporting himself and Olle underground. We see shadows of similar beings with white glowing eyes looking at Olle as he wanders through the woods. They don't seem to be as friendly as Lemus, but thankfully they never interact with Olle. Giants has been mentioned in folklore for a very long time and they come in many different versions depending on the source. Stories of giants can be found all around the world and in Norse mythology they were a race separate from the Aesir or gods and were very similar to them in many ways. Most of the time they were fighting each other but every now and then they would see eye to eye and even marry each other. The giants of mythology were powerful beings like the gods while in folklore and fairy tales they will be depicted as something completely different. In folklore they were at times synonymous with trolls, not the trolls who we mentioned before that lived lives similar to us, but the more monstrous ones. These were solitary beings that would rather keep to themselves. They were believed to be responsible for the giant rocks that can be found all around nature. These rocks were known as jättekast or trollkast which can be translated into giant throw or troll throw. It was believed giants had thrown them there, either when throwing rocks at each other or because they tried to throw the rocks at churches to silence the church bells. In fairy tales they were usually very dumb and usually evil, an antagonist to the tale's hero. The hero would usually win by outsmarting the giant since they were too strong and big to beat with brawn. Olle accidentally gets drawn to the lake where Necken resides, enchanted by the melody of Necken's fiddle. In the game, Necken is portrayed as a creepy looking male figure with green skin, long hair and a haunting face. He stops playing his fiddle as he spots Olle and tries to chase him down. In the game we learn of the story of how Necken was transformed into his twisted being. We see him play the fiddle in a village where he plays his cursed melody until the villagers can no longer dance and they all go mad and die. This story is very reminiscent of the tale of Horga Dansen and similar folk tales from Sweden where the devil disguised as a fiddler arrives in the village of Horga where he starts to play a melody that the youth of the village had never heard before. As they start to dance they realize this is no ordinary fiddler as his eyes burn like embers and they've seen cloven hooves where his feet should be. He led them out of the village up the mountain of Horga where he sat in a tree and played his music until all that was left was their heads jumping around the tree. A very unfortunate end indeed and a fitting story of Necken in this game. Necken was a water spirit in Swedish and Norwegian folklore and fairy tales, used to caution anyone to get too close to dangerous waters, as he would try to drown anyone who he managed to lure into the waters. He was known by many names, such as Strömkarlen, Forskarlen or Nuck, which is similar to the Norwegian name. Necken was believed to live in all lakes and rivers, where he would sit and play his fiddle or harp. He was usually described as being very beautiful and naked and portrayed in art in a very romantic way. But sometimes he was described as an old man in grey clothes, more akin to a tomte. In some parts of Sweden he could also take the shape of a beautiful white horse known as Bäckahesten that would walk on land and trick children into riding him into the river where he would drown them. His spine would grow longer and longer, so it would fit every child that wanted to join the ride, not knowing or realizing that it wasn't a normal horse. 
Necken wasn't always a malicious water spirit, as there are tales of him teaching willing people how to play the fiddle, and anyone who was taught by him would be exceptionally talented. There were also ways to protect oneself from Necken. One way was to stick a knife into the ground close to the shores as this would bind him to the waters and he wouldn't be able to lure or drown anyone. The logic in this is that all magical creatures feared iron. In the fairy tale Sjökungen and Agneta, Necken is portrayed as a beautiful spirit of the lake who falls in love with a woman named Agneta. He lures Agneta down under the water with his music where she forgets her life on land and she becomes his bride. She stays there for a very long time, giving him seven sons and one day she can hear the church bell echoing down to the depths of the lake and the spell is broken. She could now remember her old life from before. Devastated she begs for him to let her go and he says she can go visit her old family as long as she returns by nightfall. When reunited with her aging father, she breaks her promise and refuses to return to her captor, leaving her seven sons behind. Tuva is a character that aids Ole in his quest to save his sister. She is also the source of the magical light that Ole's sister finds at the start of the game. When first encountered, we see her sitting by a dark tarn in the deep dark wood, a setting very reminiscent of the classical painting of Princess Tuvstar by Jan Bauer. Tuva is inspired by the character Princess Tuvstar, a character from the fairy tale written by Helge Kjellin. The story is about the aforementioned princess who befriends a moose named Skut. They travel the forest together and they go deeper and deeper and further from home and eventually Scott wants to show Tuvstar a beautiful but dangerous tarn. During her travels her clothes are stolen by the Skook's Row and her crown taken by fairies. All she has left is her golden heart gifted by her mother. As they approach the tarn Tuvstar wants to take a closer look while Scott warns her to not get too close and as she leans over the water, her golden necklace with a golden heart slips over her head and drops down into the dark and murky waters. Tuvstar cries as she sees the golden heart disappear and its glow fading, as it was a gift from her mother when Tuvstar was born. Skut tells her that sadly it's now lost forever and that they instead should return home. But Tuvstar tells him to leave her because surely she will find the necklace. Skut leaves her as he knows that she is now forever lost as she will never get the golden heart back. And so she is still there, gazing down into the dark waters of the forest tarn, hoping to find the golden heart. The Kjär Hexa or the Swamp Witch is portrayed as a mysterious being that can at first be mistaken as a scarecrow wearing the skull of a beast. The Kjär Hexa lives in the swamp where she performs dark rituals and blood sacrifices with the help of her midwife where they drown small children for their dark purposes. The witches of Swedish folklore and fairy tales may be evil at most times, but none of them are portrayed as evil as the Kjär Hexa. In folklore, they were described to be the same as most northern European witches, mostly women in league with the devil. The witches of Sweden were said to have unholy sabbath and orgies with the devil at a place called Blåkulla. And the location of Blåkulla differs depending on where in Sweden the stories are told. A very common concept is the milk stealing aspect of the witches in folklore. The devil helped the witches steal milk from unsuspecting farmers for unknown reasons. Perhaps it was a way for the farmers to explain why their cows weren't giving them milk as they normally would. But like most magical beings, witches or hags were believed to also be friendly and helpful if met with respect and could help those willing to accept their aid. In Swedish fairy tales we can find some different mentions of witches, sometimes described as hag-like beings living alone out in the woods, minding their own business, doing what witches do 
until Odin comes riding with his wild hunt, chasing the witches and other creatures away to hide in their holes deep in the woods. Sometimes they were portrayed as trolls, so being a witch wasn't exclusive to humans. In the fairy tale The Boy Who Was Never Afraid by Swedish author Alfred Smedberg, there is a witch who also happens to be a troll, but also described as a skogsrå, a guardian of the forest. First, what is a myling? The myling in Swedish folklore was a spirit of an infant who was murdered. In the game, we see the midwife performing the Kärhexa's dark ritual to sacrifice a small child, which would most likely turn it into a myling. Maybe you wondered what those dark spirits in the waters of the swamps were. They were mylings. This means the Kärhexa and the midwife have murdered maybe hundreds of children for their rituals. When playing the game, this is what we first assumed and got it confirmed by looking at the game's soundtrack on Spotify. As Ole is wading through the waters among the dark spirits, we can hear the track named Mylingar playing, implying that these are indeed the spirits of murdered children. In Swedish folklore, the Mjuling is said to specifically be the result of a mother killing their newborn child, unwanted or discarded for different reasons. Usually the mother would hide the dead child under the boards in the house or outside deep down underground. The Mjuling would usually be seen and heard by people passing by as it cried, sang or sometimes even spoke to the strangers who didn't know who or what they were speaking to. To release the Myling from this world, one would have to give it a name, or find and bury the body in consecrated ground. This would bring the Myling peace, and it would pass on to the other side. As Olle finds the midwife hanging from a tree, we can see two crows or ravens sitting on top of her. This might be a hint at the corvids being Natramn. In Swedish folklore, the Natram was said to be the spirit of a self-murderer, or sometimes dead, unchristened children. Usually the Natram would take the shape of a raven. On Spotify there is a track called Vatten Ormen and the name can be translated to water snake, meaning it could either be a literal snake stalking Olle, or it could be an implication that it's something supernatural. In some parts of the game, we can see Olle getting chased by something unseen under the water. Could this be the so-called Vattenorm, or water snake? In Swedish folklore and fairy tales, there is a being known as Lindorm, it was known to be an enormous snake with draconic features that lived deep inside the forest. And like most cultures, there is also a type of monstrous water snake, which might of course be what the developers of the game thought of when creating this. The Lyktgubbe, or the Lantern Man, is seen in the game as a mysterious being that helps Olle traverse the world by leading him with his lantern. He looks like an old man with long hair, tattered brown robes with moss or grass growing on his shoulders. He brings Olle to a safe realm, which is in the shape of an old library, where the Lyktgubbe keeps books of lore. In folklore it was believed that the light that sometimes was seen in fields, mires and swamps was the light of the lantern held by the being known as Lyktgubbe. The Lyktgubbe was believed to be the spirit of a dead man, lost in his afterlife and therefore not being able to find peace. He would wander the world alone during the night, trying to find what or who he was looking for. Those who have claimed to see him the Lyktgubbe describe him as a very small man in dark or grey clothes, holding his lantern in one hand. He could be very helpful to those who showed him respect, and would help those lost in the woods to find their way back home as long as they were kind to him in return. But he could also be a trickster, and could sometimes be the cause of people being lost in the woods.
The Skuxro is portrayed as a powerful female entity with antlers and long dark hair draped over her naked body. Her back is hollowed out like an old tree and inside you can see her red heart beating, emanating with her power. She tries to lure Ulle by tricking him into following an illusion that resembles his sister, but the illusion is broken as Ulle enters an opening in the forest where the Skuxro is waiting for him. In folklore there are several different depictions and descriptions of the Skogsrå. They were known by different names besides Skogsrå, names like Huldra, Rondan, Talmaja or Skogsfru were all synonymous. The Rå in her name comes from the word Rådare or Guardian, making the Skogsrå a guardian of her domain in the forest. The Skogsrå is a very beautiful young woman with an otherworldly way to lure her prey her prey being men alone or lost in the woods. Using her beauty, she would attract lone men with occupations like hunters, lumberjacks, charcoal workers and others who had their reasons for being far from home, deep in her domain in nature. Usually her beauty was stained by a haunting void in her back, similar to that of a hollow or dead tree. Sometimes she would have a fox or cow tail, these were telltale signs to look out for if you were to see a young woman alone out in the woods. Some men she would instantly kill if they in some way disrespected nature, and others she would use for longer periods, luring them back over and over again, and sometimes she would even have a family together with the man. The men could not get over their obsession with their newfound love due to her magic. Sometimes her enchanting power over these men could be broken, usually by in some way tricking her into breaking the enchantment. But like most entities in Nordic folklore, she didn't always have malicious intent. If you showed her kindness and respect, she would be friendly towards you. Giving her gifts could give you a good hunt, or she could give you warning signs of danger lurking in the woods. Pesta is encountered in the fishing village as Ulle traverses the waters before arriving at the halls of the mountain king. She can be first seen stalking him in the fishing village before appearing behind him in the boat, forcing Ulle into another dimension where battle takes place. In Nordic folklore, the personification of the Black Death took many forms. Tales were told of strangers that would travel from village to village and with their brooms and rakes, they would sweep the lands and spread the disease. The strangers would be described as both men, women and children, and as they couldn't traverse waters by themselves, they would try to get a ride by boat from unsuspecting victims that would help spread the plague. In Norway, the folkloric entity of the Black Death was known as the demonic woman named Pesta. She was described as an old woman with greyish pale skin, long dark hair, black eyes and a blue or red traditional dress. She would, like the other personifications of the Black Death, use her rake and broom and walk from village to village spreading the plague. As folkloric illustrations became popular in the mid 1800s to early 1900s, Pesta became one of Theodor Kittelsen's most famous motives in his art. Her gaunt and staring face pierces through the canvas in these haunting illustrations, which makes it understandable why the developers of the game chose to use Kittelsen's work as inspiration for this character. In the fishing village where Ole is being stalked by Pesta, we can find undead humans inflicted with the Bramble Curse. On the soundtrack there is a track called Draugr, which plays as Ole is being chased by the horde of the undead. Drog is an ancient name originating from Norse mythology. They were described as spirits of the dead inhabiting a corpse. They were horrifying creatures with necrotic black or blue skin tone and they had magical powers and brutal physical strength while maintaining some of their human intellect. Later on in Norwegian folklore the name Drog was given to the revenant of fishermen who drowned at sea and who never got a proper burial. Fishermen warned each other of the drog as it would try to drag them down and drown them 
never to return to shore again. In the game, we first see the Mountain King in the books found at the Lichtgubbes library, in which we learn about the king's tragic story, which earns him the name the Mountain King. We later see the Mountain King himself, as Ulla arrives at the mountain by boat. Deep inside the mountain, in its halls, the Mountain King sits on his throne. He looks like he could be a normal old human king, but he is tall as the mountain itself chained by Bramble and waiting for his next sacrifice. The term Mountain King was used in both folklore and fairy tales when talking about a troll king that ruled the mountain in which the troll lived. In folklore it wasn't always a troll and was sometimes believed to be the mountain counterpart of the Skogsrå, namely the Bergsrå. The baddies row could be male or female, but usually when male it was referred to the mountain king or the mountain troll. In the play in verse Per Gunt by Norwegian dramatist Henrik Ibsen from 1876, the main character Per finds himself in the hall of the mountain king, which is also the name of the very famous melody which originates from this play. This melody is also used in the game during the final boss fight, but here the melody can be heard with the developer's own twist. It is awesome. The Mountain King from the play is described as being a troll king, so not human as it is in the game, and in his hall Per Gunt sees a plethora of trolls and other otherworldly beings living in the mountain. In Norwegian, which is the play's original language, the mountain king is called Dovre Gubben, which points at the scene in the play taking place in the Dovre mountain. And that was all the folklore we could show you today. We hope you enjoyed the video, and if you want to see more of our videos, feel free to watch our playlist for English speaking, or the rest of our videos if you speak Swedish, of course. Now, remember to watch out for Necken and the other creatures the next time you venture through the woods, and we'll see you on the other side. Bye.